Let's take this new theory, which accounts for the shell effect, and see how it describes lead, which turns out to be, on average, more stable than predicted by the liquid drop model. This is an experiment, and this is the calculation. See how well he profiled what was obtained in the experiment. We will use the difference, which is quite small, only about 1 mega electron volt. Now we will continue this calculation to a zone where there are no elements falling within the liquid drop model. And here we see a decrease, then an increase, and then another decrease. We can expect some increased stability for element 108, which has 162 neutrons. But even greater stability can be expected for element 114, which has a massive amount of neutrons, of 184 in total. These will also be doubly magic nuclei. And if we look at the system of levels again, then we see a gap. 108 protons and 162 neutrons, 114 protons and 184 neutrons, and so on. And with this information, we can paint a landscape containing all of these shell corrections. And we see that, if we have lead, for which this correction is 14 mega electron volt, and go further, then it falls, almost disappearing, then it suddenly appears again around where Z equals 108 and the number of neutrons is 162, before falling and reappearing again with about 114 protons and 184 neutrons. Now, if we consider our world, we will have to say that these shell effects, or structure effects, or magic effects that we saw on lead, can also be present in the deformed nucleus. And thanks to these effects, we see uranium or thorium here, but this is not where it ends. Continuing further, we can see the next shell, 108 and 162 neutrons. These nuclei are very similar to this one, but if we go further, we will see 114 and 184. It will be a spherical X nucleus similar to lead. And then, if everything is correct, we can see how the spontaneous division will take place and how the shell behaves when the deformation of the nucleus increases. It has always been assumed that the shell operates in the ground state. But as soon as the nucleus is stretched, we tear the entire structure. This is, in fact, not true. The structure does not break, it simply changes and becomes different for the deformed nucleus. It behaves in this way because the energy levels always change during a large deformation. Some levels go down and others go up. If we have some magical effect here, it might not manifest itself directly here, but then it appears later in other places. In other words, because we stretch the nucleus, we do not tear its structure, we change it, but it is still there and will continue to play a huge role in the stability of nuclei with respect to spontaneous fission. I want to give you an example, an example that was given by the famous physicist Sviatetsky when he explained how the structure works when we stretch the nucleus. Imagine that there is a forest in front of you, a dense natural forest, and you are trying to see what is happening in this forest, but you cannot see anything because the trees are in the way. You turn your head, but it does not help you because the forest is continuous. But if you have a man-made forest that is mapped, it is obvious that along these trees you will be able to see what is happening within the forest. This is clear. 
But what is interesting, if you turn your head in any direction, you will still be able to see what is happening in any direction, because this is a man-made forest, and therefore it is structured. This is how the structure works when we start to deform the nucleus. So we have this liquid drop, this structure, and now we have to add another liquid drop along with this correction, which is a structural one. And then we get an amazing barrier, up to uranium. The barrier is completely different from the one that was in the original liquid drop. It now has two soft peaks like a two-humped camel. It has a ground state from which spontaneous fission with a period of 10 to the power of 16 years occurs, and it has an isomeric state. Here it only needs to penetrate a small peak, which is 0.3 microseconds. Here is an explanation of the isomerism of the form. So, as an example, let's take uranium-238. We calculate the liquid drop model of the barrier. We make a structural correction and take the sum of these two quantities and as a result we get an amazing picture that explains all the isomerisms of the transuranic elements. And then we use this formula in an unknown zone. We go where there is no liquid drop barrier, where it is zero. But again, we calculate the structural correction, which looks like this, and now we add this barrier, this slope with this, and as a result we get a barrier. A barrier of a completely different nature. A barrier of a structural nature. If we heat this nucleus, this barrier will melt. If we heat the nucleus to a very high temperature, then it will be completely unstable. If the barriers are only slightly heated, and we make our calculations according to this new microscopic model of the nucleus, the results will describe everything that happened before. We can predict that this will not be zero, but rather the appearance of just such barriers in the place where we find these magic numbers of protons and neutrons. Here is a graph depicting the heights of the fission barriers. This is the known barrier for lead, 28 mega electron volt. This is the known barrier for uranium, 6 mega electron volt. And here, fermium-252 appears. This one, which is the 108th element, hassium, and this one, the 114th element, which is now called fluorovium. And the presence of a barrier gives a drastic increase in the lifespan of the element, such as elements 112, 114, and 116, which have this magic structure. In relation to what the model of a liquid drop predicted, their stability increases by about 20 to 30 orders of magnitude. And here we have a different graph. Here again is lead, here is uranium and thorium. But some formations have already started appearing here, a kind of sandbank, and a large zone of very heavy, or as we call it, super heavy elements. It forms the so-called island of stability. You have probably heard this term many times before. If this is an island, then we call it a sandbank. Then what we had behind lead, thorium, uranium, forms a peninsula. And the fact that it is stable makes it a continent, and everything else is a sea of instability. Any other combination of protons and neutrons does not give us a formation such as a nucleus. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that, in the middle of this island, there may be nuclei that are almost a million years old, where there were none at all, where elements should not have existed. Now a large number of elements are predicted to be, at the top of which can reach very large values.